like to invite us <clears throat> to just bow your heads as I pray. Our Father, we thank you again for the opportunity of opening your word and learning more about you. Allow the Holy Spirit to be in our hearts as we open it for him today. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen. I read many years ago a story about Sarah Lee. I don't know if you are familiar with Sarah Lee. You know, there's a lot of them in the in the grocery store. It's a consumer good uh, corporation or company. So, as I read the story, it was it was something about the Sarah Lee cake mix. The Sarah Lee cake mix. Are you familiar with that product of Sara Lee Corporation? Well, they actually came out a cake mix, according to the story, where the instruction was to just add water and you have a fluffy, sweet, and nice looking cake. But to their shock and amazement, Sara Lee Corporation was surprised because no one was buying it. No one was buying it, that particular cake mix product. So we did, they did some kind of uh, research. They did some kind of research and they found out that the people weren't buying it because it was just so easy to do. <laughs> It was just too easy to do. So, not too, not too many people were, were ready to receive the cake mix. That you only have to add water, and that's it. You have already the cake. A lot of them don't like that. They were suspicious of it. They were suspicious of it. And so, the company took a good amount of further research and study about cake mixes. So they changed the instruction. They changed the instruction, and now instead of just adding water, add an egg. <laughs> add water, and you should also add an egg. And as soon as they were made, and that adjustment was made, the cake mix just started like flying off the shelves. A lot of them were buying the cake mix. Is it any wonder that sometimes we just don't like things to be so easy? Is it any wonder? And I found out that in most cases this is exactly how it is in our Christian walk. In our Christian walk. In salvation, for example, or in righteousness, we just don't want it to be so easy. We just don't want it to be just relaxed. To receive that free gift by faith. We want to do something. We want to prove that we have given some sort of contribution to this process, what we call salvation. Salvation by faith. Now what we're going to find out in the world today is that there can never be for that person who really receives full salvation without doing anything in himself. Now please turn your Bibles that was read earlier in Psalm, I mean in 1 John 7 1 John 1, 7 to 10. You have your Bible video. I'm just so sorry that I was not able to do that on my PowerPoint as I usually did. But if you have your analog Bible, or maybe a digital Bible, open it to 1 John chapter 1. And then we, let's begin reading from verses 7 and 8, 9 and 10. I'll be reading from the New International Version. It says here, But if we walk in the light, 
as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from our, all sin. Verse 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And then verse 10, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. You know, the Apostle John makes it very clear that as Christian believers, we've been called out of the world. We've been called out of the world to a thorough and unique way of fellowship with the Father, with the Son, of course, with the Holy Spirit and with all believers. We have been called into a unique, very unusual fellowship together with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit with all of the believers. So John starts to tell us here that what are some of the benefits of being in the distinctive inner circle, distinctive inner circle for all of us as believers. John seeks to address the sin problem. If you try to read that particular passages. John seeks to address the sin problem because he wants us to know that sin cannot abide in the light where God is. Sin cannot abide in the light where God is. So God has to deal with sin. God has to deal with sin. But you know, brothers and sisters, this sin problem is not anything that we of ourselves can even ever address. We cannot address that. We can never solve that particular problem. We can never solve the sin problem. We can never do anything to remedy our situation. We can never do that. Therefore, God has to act. And He has acted in His only Son, Jesus Christ, in order for us to be remedied of this particular problem. So Jesus Christ, once and for all, has to deal with the sin problem. But will our hearts be ready to accept? We keep trying to give you know, our own contribution. We keep trying to do our own way of, you know, doing our own contribution. We keep trying to exert our will. You know, we keep trying to push. We keep trying to strategize. We keep trying to scheme, to escape, to schedule, and to plan. How are we going to work our way out of this sin predicament that we are in? But you know, Cleansing from sin is not something our will can affect. We cannot affect the cleansing of our sin by our own selves alone. It can only come as a free gift received from God that has been made possible through the spilled blood of Jesus Christ, His dear Son. That can only be solved there. There's only one thing that we can do. There's only one thing. And notice this. There's only one thing that we can do in order to receive the Holy Spirit. And what is that one thing? We must confess. We must confess. And even though this is simple, it is not easy. It is not easy. We have to acknowledge. When we confess, we have to acknowledge our wrong. We have to acknowledge our sinful desires for the same reason that we're always trying to work so hard to work our way out of sin. You know, it's the same reason why we don't like to acknowledge wrong. Because what? Of spiritual pride. Of spiritual pride. 
We don't want to be exposed from being really as deceitful and as conniving and ill will and wicked and contemptuous. And the list goes on and on and on as we really are. Nothing seems so degrading, my friends, to all of us, to the fallen human nature. Let us always remember that there is nothing in us that can cleanse us, that can free us from the entanglements of sin. This is the same type of pride that affects us spiritually. It's the same pride that makes us want to use our will, our will to improve ourselves and causes us to want to defend ourselves, you know, without admitting that we're wrong. We want to justify self. We want to make excuses. And that was the reason why, you know, Adam and Eve fell. They want to justify each of them that because of that particular creation or that creature, the serpent, that because of this particular creation, creation or creature, the woman, we committed this sin. We want to justify self. We, want, we, want, we try to deny. If so, we want to point out technicalities in our Christian walk. We do whatever we can so that we don't have to lose face. But this is how people in the world are today. This is how people behave today. This is what Apostle John is saying, being in the world. Being in the world means that you never would admit that you're wrong. But for those who are now in the light, those who have now come into fellowship with the Father, we are able to do something that the world cannot do. We are able to confess. We are able to tell Him that we are wrong. That we have committed mistakes. You know, when we confess, that means we acknowledge wrongdoing. If we are to translate it literally from the Greek, it means to say the same thing. To say the same thing. When we confess, we are saying the same thing as another. And the other is actually God. By confessing, we are declaring that God's declaration of our guilt before Him is actually true. That's what it means to confess. So I want us to see an example of genuine confession. A genuine and a typical confession that is found in the Bible. And I want us to see this classic example that is found in Psalm chapter 51, verses 1 and 2. Let's open again our Bibles. And it takes a while because it's on the Old Testament. Psalm 51, verses 1 and 2. A classic and typical example of confession. Let's begin in verse 1 of chapter 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Who said this? David. King David. Remember, remember David committed so many mistakes. But there was one that really stand, stood out. And that was his relation with Bathsheba. But here, he repented, he confessed, and verse 2 says, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from sin. That's a typical and classic example of confession. You know, David confessed freely. He confessed openly. He doesn't hide. He doesn't rationalize. He doesn't try to negotiate or compromise. He lays it out there. He lays it out there before God. He lays himself before God. He says, God, yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I know it. 
He confessed freely. He confessed openly. But you know what, brothers and sisters? This type of vulnerability is only possible in a safe environment. So look at what causes David to have this type of openness and admitted that he is wrong. Look at verse 1 again. David knows the heart of God. David knows. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. He knows the heart of God. David knows the heart of God. He knows that God is a God of unconditional love. He knows that God is a God of unconditional love and a God of tender mercies, a God of loving kindness. He's patient and he's long-suffering. What is long-suffering? It's long-extended. That's long-suffering. It won't run out. His patience won't run out. His mercy is everlasting. Imagine that. You know, the Lord recognized that God's heart of love, that God is not out to get us, that God is actually is for us, is for you, is for me. He's on our side. He's on our side, that God is actually for us. He's not willing that all of us will perish. No. The more we see His heart of love, my friends, the more open we are to confess before Him what we have done and how we really are living in this world. You show me a person that can admit that they're wrong and I'll show you a person who does not let go of the love and absolute acceptance of God. This is what John is trying to tell us. So let's go back. Go back to that verse in uh, first uh, in John, but this time it's Second John chapter two, the next chapter of Second John. I mean First John, First John one, verse two. Let's go there. I hope you have it already. First John two. I'm sorry, chapter two, verse one and two. What does it say there? It says, 1 John chapter 2, 1 and 2. It says, My little children, these things I write to you, so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have what? An advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, what? The righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Yeah. Wonderful. God bless us. His atoning sacrifice. In other words, his atoning sacrifice for the whole world. But only those of us who have accepted him are able to receive the benefits of the atonement. Hence we see the heart of God. God has provided a full solution of the sin problem. What was the full solution? Through His Son, Jesus Christ. First of all, He has provided Jesus, as John says, as an advocate. Advocate. Do you know the word advocate means? One who stands before a judge in behalf of another. In other words, an attorney, a lawyer. We are right there before the judgment seat of God, my friends. Right there. All alone. But be happy because there is an advocate with us standing by our side. And who is that? Jesus Christ, the Son of God. One who stands before a judge on behalf of another. So now, Jesus becomes our defense attorney, in other words. In the litigation there in heaven that's going on, 
Jesus is our defense attorney. So we stand there guilty. We stand there. We are messed up. We are broken. We are wrong. Guilty. But he stands before the Father, who is the judge, the righteous one, stands before the Father and he says, Lord, Father, before you, I stand between you and him and her. I represent him, O oh God, my Father. I represent her. I stand on his or her behalf. I represent him. I protect her. I protect her. Jesus, my friends, is our advocate. He is our mediator. He is the go-between. He pleads our case before the Father. The same word here used for advocate is the same word is used for the Holy Spirit. Did you know that? The same word advocate is also the same word that is used for the Holy Spirit that we translate paraclete. In Greek, we translate it as paraclete, which means what? A helper, a comforter. So this saying that through the Holy Spirit, what happens? We have a helper down here. We have a helper down here. But in Jesus Christ, we have a helper up there before the throne of God. Isn't that wonderful, my friends? Because paraclete is also a helper or meaning helper or counselor or comforter. That applies also to the Holy Spirit as it applies to Jesus Christ. So while we are here in this world, we have a helper, which is the Holy Spirit. We have a helper down here. And right there we have also <coughs> a helper who is Jesus Christ up there. You know, one Central African tribe, when they translate this in the Bible, they translate this as the one who falls down beside you. In that particular Central African tribe. The one who falls down beside you. In other words, you know, the picture is the picture of a person that is laid out there in the dirt on the side of the road. And then someone comes along and have to fall down and to get down on her knee, on his knees. And then someone comes there and try to, you know, care the wounds and wrap the wounds to help him recover. That's what Jesus is. That's what Jesus is. He is our advocate. He is our helper. He's the one who falls down besides us. And we fall down and he comes down to where we are. And he wraps us, wrap us up. He cleanses us up. He fixes us up. That's what Jesus is, my friends. That's what God has provided in his son. He also says he is the atoning sacrifice. You know, the great, uh, the King James Version translated this way, propitiation. We read earlier in 2 John, uh, 1 John chapter 2. Propitiation means two things, at least. Number one means, it is a means of atonement. It is a means of atonement. In other words, he is the one that does what is necessary to make atonement. To make atonement possible. Sin demands death. You know that. We know that. The Bible says, for the wages of sin, what? Is death. So sin demands death. So we should die. We should die. We have been accepted without dying of ourselves. Don't you know that? We have been accepted without dying of ourselves. You know what Jesus does? He makes atonement. He makes atonement for us possible by being the one to die in our place. The propitiation also means a place where atonement happens. So where the high priest, you know, once a year, they call it the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur, the high priest would sprinkle the blood on top of the mercy seat in the most holy place. He would sprinkle the blood on top of the mercy seat on the Day of Atonement. That mercy seat was called the propitiation. The propitiation, the place where the atonement happens. Jesus is the place, my friends. Jesus is the place. Are you looking for a forgiveness? 
Are you looking for peace with God? Are you looking for this alienation, enslavement that will finally end? Are you living for peace and assurance that there's between you and heaven we look over? Jesus is the place. He brings Calvary in us. And he says, right here, right here, brother, right here, brother, sister, right here, son, right here, daughter, this is the place. Because this is the place where peace is made. Atonement is made for you. Atonement is made for me, for all of us. You know what? God is the one who makes him all of this for us. He is the one who made this all for all, for us. So Jesus is not just on our side. No, not just on our side, but the Father is also on our side. Now tell me, tell me, can, I, can you confess your wrong to someone like that? You think you can confess your wrong to someone like that? Who believes the word of God today? Thank you. We'll confess ourselves, our sins. Why? Verse 9 of 1 John 1 says, Because He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May the Lord bless us. Now we are going to go to our communion service. First, we will do the ordinance of...